Welcome to the Drunk Dietitians Podcast, co-hosted by your favorite tipsy registered dietitians, yours truly, Sammy Previtt, co-owner of Dietitians of Palm Valley, and Jenna Warner, owner of Happy Strong Healthy. Us dietitian besties can't stand diet culture bullshit and love keeping it real. Our mission is for all humans to believe that they are made for so much more than chasing a smaller body. We are also here to share with you that food can be fun and pleasurable again. Although we're medical professionals, we are human too. We are not afraid to share our deepest secrets and how years of our lives were taken by diet culture. We started this podcast so no human has to feel alone in their journey towards food freedom. So grab your favorite cocktail and join us for our favorite casual happy hour and expect to laugh, cry, learn, and grow. Cheers. So on today's episode, I like feel like I'm so zen right now <laughs> because we just had on my personal therapist as our guest. Katie we had a dual Stewart. session. <laughs> yes. We had a drunk dietitian session with Katie Stewart. She is local to Jacksonville, um, but she also sees clients virtually, which we just thought with COVID-19, not that y'all need therapy, but everyone <laughs> should have therapy. So she'll be a great resource in case you need a therapy session. But Jenna, what did you think of today's episode? Honestly, my key takeaway, there was a lot. And I don't want to give too many of them away because I really want you guys to listen to really the whole episode because I think we build a lot on the takeaway items and action items that you can really apply and think about for yourself as the episode builds. But one of the keys that I, I really appreciated her wisdom on was the signs and symptoms of general depression and acute depression and situational depression very much related to what's happening right now and i think katie called it generalized trauma or universal trauma and how we're all really experiencing this trauma together and if you don't have methods of self-care and self-love and therapy in your life currently and you're feeling these things and you didn't really know what you were feeling she really gives a lot of great information to help you identify some of these feelings and work through them which was like she said it so beautifully because she's amazing but also it was so clear and it really made me take a deep breath <laughs> yeah i completely agree with you and i think just like you said i don't want to give too much away but i think saying this up front could be helpful because it, it taught again it, there's we go so much more in detail and like you said with action items but that like emotional exhaustion is a real thing mm. you don't need to be working out seven days a week and going to work every day and commuting to have exhaustion like you could be stuck in your house due to covid19 pandemic and feel like it's hard to get out of bed and so going like like she went deep into that and ways around that and i mean that was huge i think just for me to hear too because i've definitely been feeling that and it, it, you almost like you need to hear it like the permission yeah. for it to be okay it it's a confusing time and i think a lot of what katie said made me feel for lack of a better term more normal mm -hmm. in a time where i don't think anybody knows what normal feels like or means or and it's changing every single day um she was awesome it was so great and we can't wait for you guys to hear it sam thanks for sharing your therapist with us of course <laughs> of course i mean i'm locked in as a client so y'all better hurry up before her, her schedule books up but um no she's a very very special person and so without further ado we will give you katie stewart Welcome back to another episode of Drunk Dietitians. Today's guest is near and dear to my heart. Um, it is Katie Stewart, who, before I even get into your bio, I'm just going to enter you as my personal therapist, um, because <laughs> to me, that's the most important thing, because you seriously are like my lifesaver. Um, but a little bit about Katie, she's the clinical field site coordinator for the clinical Men mental health counseling program at Jacksonville University here in Jacksonville, Florida. 
She also has her own private practice, the Center for Intuitive Living and Wellness. Um, she sees clients both in person and virtual. Um, and right now, due to coronavirus, is 100% virtual. Um, and she specializes in eating and body image concerns. She is a certified intuitive eating counselor. I'm um, oh, certified, awesome. I know, under um, Evelyn Triboli. Um, she does so many things. She, special, she also specializes or is trained in brain spotting, which we will talk about. She's all about self-empowerment, discovery. She pulls in emotional, physical, spiritual health into her practice. So without further ado, let's all welcome Katie. Katie, and those Thank of you, you that are only listening, I mean, Sammy is smiling through her entire face right now. It's so nice to hear. And she's talking about therapy the same way she talks about food. It's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> it's so much fun to talk about. <laughs> I, I honestly, the other day, Luke and I, my husband were chatting and I was like, Katie's like inspired me. I'm like, I want to go back to school. But then I'm like, no, I actually don't want to do that. But I'm like, <laughs> for what? Well, I just for feel what? like knowing like with intuitive eating, everything we're learning and being mm -hmm. a dietitian, people often say to me, like, I don't know if you can help me. I need like, psycho I need a psychologist or a therapist. And I'm like, well, no, mm -hmm. we have this skill set, but I can't imagine like having both. Mm. being a therapist and a dietitian, how helpful that could be. I have had the same exact thought for myself, except the opposite about going back for like nutrition and dietetics. And I've, that's gone through my brain probably like 20 times in the past two years. But then I have to just check myself and be like, <laughs> okay, you're fine. Everybody exists for a reason. <laughs> yeah. I can't wait to hear more about this, Katie, like more about how intuitive eating came into your world and how you blend it all together. Like I'm thrilled for it. I'm so excited, yeah. but we're going to start out with a little this or that first. So just the first thing that pops into your head and for all of our listeners, I am popping in a new question today. I'm pumped about it and I can't wait to hear your answer. So here we go. Coffee oh. or tea? Coffee. Wine or beer? Wine. Dogs or cats? Dogs. <laughs> no, I was laughing as I was saying it because I knew your answer. Um, vodka or tequila? Uh, college tequila, currently vodka. <laughs> Fair. I'm opposite. I'm opposite. <laughs> <in that regard. laughs> so here's the big one of the day. Runny egg or hard-boiled yolk? Uh, in the middle? Is that a runny? <laughs> yeah, I'm like in the middle. Like I don't want it getting all mushy, but I also You're not a want yolk a middle. girl. I like a little yolk, <laughs> a little a little mush. <laughs> Sam, what would you be? I hate runny eggs. Like what? they they repulse me. Oh my god, I'm all for a runny egg. Okay, <laughs> here we go. Smooth or crunchy peanut butter? A uh, crunchy. Okay. I used to be too, but I'm <laughs> on the dark side. Glad to have you on my team right now. Okay. Um, the last question we have, if you could have anything in limitless quantities, but it can't be money, what would it be? Rescue dogs. Oh, I love that. Is Cash a rescue? He is. Oh, I got I him when that. he was four months old though, so he's pretty much been here all along, but he's technically rescue. I really want to rescue a dog right now. I, there's so many dogs in the homes right now. I know. But, well, thank you so much for being here. I'm so excited yeah. for this episode. And can you tell us a little bit more about you? Huh. That's a broad <laughs> question. Just, I know. I feel like start with like, especially professionally, but personally too, just like what kind of got you into this field and, and of mm -hmm. course blending it with intuitive eating and kind of how you've ended up where you're at today. Yeah. That's people ask me that sometimes. And I'm always like, I don't really know how I got here. <laughs> <laughs> like just kind of wandered through school and figured out I wanted to be a therapist, but I wasn't one of those people that's like, I'm going to do this when I'm older. I'm set on it. Like I have absolutely every intention of pursuing medicine or engineering or whatever it is. Um, but I knew I wanted to do something in the helping profession. So I didn't know if that was teaching, nutrition, dietetics, um, counseling, social work, what that would be. But my sister, who is nine years older than me, is also a therapist, which is kind of funny. Um, cause we're the only two kids. We're always like, mom, like <laughs> something's weird here. Both your daughters are therapists, but <laughs> <laughs> I 
she doesn't think it's funny. Um, but Our family dinner is like a lot of therapy sessions. <laughs> like, there, are a lot, there are a lot of talk after dinner. <laughs> just me and my sister. <laughs> um, but so I learned more about the counseling field from her because honestly, growing up, like there was not talk of therapy. There was not talk of counseling. I don't even think I knew that therapists existed really, except for what I saw on TV. So um, in college, I just kind of got, I got, I got my degree in undergrad, but I really enjoyed myself too. Um, <laughs> so I got, I was in a major where a lot of the basketball players were also in that major. I went to, <laughs> I went to UNC, Chapel Hill, so we're a big basketball school. Um, but I, I majored in like interpersonal communications, which is like, what exactly do you do with that? But it's a great prereq for a therapist. So, um, but anyway, long story short, after I graduated, I just kind of explored for a year, applied to a few social work counseling master's programs and slowly through that process to found more of what I want to do with it and kind of why I ended up there because I really don't like the path kind of appeared as I was on it um but for where the intuitive eating interest comes in that's more of a personal story um just like based on my own history so growing up in south mississippi very close to new orleans which is like the best food um i was what was considered i'm using air quotes but an obese child quote unquote so i was like put i was in weight watchers starting in fourth grade am i allowed to say like you names yes yeah. okay. <laughs> say whatever the like, hell this is want. your story i'm not supporting these things i'm just giving examples <laughs> Um, so it was like Weight Watchers starting in fourth grade. We did the Sugar Busters, which was popular back in the day. Um, Atkins, Weight Watchers like 12 other times in between all the others. Um, but basically on and off weird diets um, until basically I left for college and I was like, hallelujah, I am free from home. I can like be myself. So I went like through three or four states away to college. Um, but over that time, I like just focused more on, okay, I was wanting to lose weight because that's all I knew in my head. So I ended up losing like a little over a hundred pounds during college, but it was, it kind of became more of like, okay, I've got food issues on this other end and now it transferred into other food issues. So exercising too much, being really restrictive with what I was easy, eating, obsessing about counting calories, so then binging on stuff, obviously, later on in the day. Um, and so then I went to grad school. That disordered mentality was at its peak during grad school. And it wasn't really until I graduated from my counseling master's program that I kind of started to learn more about intuitive eating and the counseling program, so much of what you do through that process is learning about yourself, kind of so that your stuff doesn't interfere with what you're doing with your clients. Um, so I learned a lot about me during that process. <laughs> like, why have I never gone to therapy? Okay, it's fine. Um, obviously started doing therapy for myself once I was learning to be a therapist. And um, then just discovered intuitive eating soon after graduating. And it was just this huge paradigm shift. And I got so excited, but also so just mad at like all of the stuff that had been basically like 20 years of my life at that point of being told, do this, don't do that, exercise this way. Oh, you really shouldn't wear that because you know your legs aren't your best feature, like all of that stuff. Um, and I was like, I don't, I don't want this to be my life. I don't want it to be the life of people I care about or really anybody that has the opportunity to learn otherwise. So that's when I kind of shifted more into the body image, food issues type of track and just how our relationship with ourself is impacted by that. And it's progressed since then. And here I am. It's my favorite. Such a killer combo. Like so amazing. 
So rare. Yeah. You're like a unicorn. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I'm, I'm definitely colorful. But <laughs> <laughs> and how did you two find each other? Oh, uh, we, we ate at Zoe's. <laughs> yes, we went to Zoe's for lunch. I think the first time I met you was at, so a PHP IOP program opened up here in Jacksonville um, mm -hmm. for eating disorder recovery. And they basically like invited every dietitian therapist in the, the um, city that like might be interested in learning more about what they had because it was the first one here in Jacksonville. So mm -hmm. I think I connected with you then. And then I was yeah. like, well, oh, I need to get lunch with her. And then a couple networking events through um, Southern Smash with McCall mm -hmm. Dempsey, a nonprofit that fights um, to raise money for eating disorder awareness. So yeah, I would say it was probably that. And then kind of similar to Katie, but I know Chrissy Harrison talks about this a lot. Like dietitians aren't required to do supervision or counseling, mm -mm. which is freaking horrible like when you really look at it like we are dealing with pe like people come to us and like they they should be going to therapy but they're not and right. so then they come to us and unload and if we're not seeking supervision or counseling or, or therapy ourselves and we're counseling others and not checking ourselves it can be dangerous so mm -hmm. but it's so complicated and sometimes other. it can be hard to recommend somebody to see a therapist. Like that's a difficult conversation, but sometimes mm -hmm. it, it has to happen. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I can't wait to refer people to you. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think that's part of the stigma still with mental health because so many people think about like what they're seeing on TV or in these movies of like the quirky therapist with you laying out on their couch and they're like psychoanalyzing you and all of this stuff. But like that's not what it is therapists and clients they laugh together they cry together they grow um mm -hmm. it's just such a evolutionary process um and i wish more people could have the experience but yeah. i think that's a really good question can you kind of give our listeners an idea of what a session with you would be like or with therapy in general or who needs it and why mm -hmm. Well, first of all, everybody needs it. <laughs> I, knew, I knew that answer. <laughs> no, I agree, I, too. <laughs> same. I did. I had a professor in grad school, I remember, and she used the term, like, tuning up, kind of like we take our cars in to get a tune-up, and she used that to describe therapy. Like, everybody at some point in their life at some point probably is just going to need a little tune up for themselves like getting that extra um that extra feedback for something someone that extra support whatever it is um so that's why i say everybody needs it it doesn't mean everyone all the time for their whole life would need it but we all go through crap <laughs> Sammy's like, <laughs> I will be your forever patient. And I think, and I, cause I think, but again, that comes from a huge place of privilege. I want to acknowledge, but, right. um, but if you, like you said, if you have those resources to get the support and just to bounce ideas and mm -hmm. from a non-judgmental viewpoint, it's, it's so helpful. Yeah. So back to Jenna's question. <laughs> so, um, as far as what an actual session would look like, um, they're, Honestly, it's pretty casual. It's just kind of like a back and forth conversation. Um, the initial session is getting a little bit more information just to know that person coming in because we're just meeting for the first time. So they've had a whole life to live up to this point. So learning more about who makes them, who they are, what their experiences have been and what their goals are from now moving forward with the therapy process. And then based on what's discuss then and what those goals are we'll just kind of move forward with um i'm there's different uh approaches to therapy so i'm more coming from an approach of yes we have a common goal together but i'm also very focused on what are you needing right now so even if i went into the session thinking okay we're going to continue talking about that thing that we left off on last time if someone comes in and they are just having a really intense emotional response to something and they just need to process through that, then that's what we're gonna do. We're just gonna talk, we're gonna 
learn more about what buttons maybe they have. And I say buttons like the triggers is another word for the buttons, but like what makes them tick, why this happens, what experiences they've had that makes them respond this way and how to kind of shift that response in a way that's going to be um, more productive, healthier, helping them to get to kind of where they want to be. Um, so a little coaching comes into that too when it's more forward focused. But yeah, everything from trauma to eating stuff to relationship stuff, it's all stuff. I know before we, we got on the call with you, we were talking about like the different I'm going to, I don't want to butcher it, but like CBT versus DBT. And like, mm -hmm. like, can you explain a little bit about like what that even means? Like from a, you know, layman's term version of what's mm -hmm. going on with those modalities, what they mean. Yeah. Yeah. So there's certain treatment modalities that based on research um, are just proven more effective to treat certain things. So CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, and DBT, which is dialectical behavioral therapy, they can both help with, you know, anxiety, helping to regulate emotions, things like that. But cognitive behavioral therapy is probably what I would use more of in my practice. Um, and it's one of the more popular types of therapy, but that's basically looking at how our thoughts, emotions, and behaviors are connected. So if I have a thought of, you know, I'm a horrible person, how is this going to make me feel? Probably either really lonely, rejected, guilty, shameful, unlovable, whatever it might be. And then what then will that feeling lead to behavior wise? So maybe that's going to lead to picking up the drug again. Maybe it's going to lead to more restrictive eating, maybe purging, like whatever that behavior is that's not healthy for us. Um, so with cognitive behavioral therapy, we look at how those thoughts, feelings, behaviors impact each other, and then try to learn how to kind of shift that thought, thought process to something that's more realistic, more um, helpful for someone. So being able to switch perspective and notice how that change in perspective can shift not only how we're feeling, but also our response to that feeling, if that makes sense. Um, so it's used a lot with anxiety, depression, um, eating disorders, um, DBT, dialectical behavioral therapy is used a lot with like borderline personality disorder and a lot of these disorders where there's more need for really intense emotional regulation. Um, and there's so many different types of therapy. Those are just two of the really popular ones. Um, but I definitely suggest anybody that's going to be maybe looking for a therapist most therapists will do a free consultation beforehand, like over the phone or through a quick um, video meeting or something. So I definitely suggest if there's a type of therapy you're interested in that you talk to them and see if they are, see if they do use that in their practice. And if not, just find someone who does, or um, if you're open to another type, then go with it. But the therapist client relationship, I really think is the most important part. So you have to feel comfortable no matter what. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Something I, I want. I wrote down so many things. I'm so pumped. I feel this. like I just talked <laughs> so fast. No, no, you, you're doing great. And I think something I just want to like, while it's in my brain, talk about real quick mm -hmm. is, you know, I, I say like, I refer everyone to you. And the reason why is yes, you have the intuitive eating, um, you know, counselor certification, which is awesome. Mm -hmm. But I think it's important, not that all therapists have to have that, right. but I have had clients come to me that their therapist praised them for weight loss, which was fueling disordered behaviors around food. And so I think it's just important to know that just like dietitians, all therapists aren't created equally and we all go through right. different backgrounds. And so what, why I, of course, love you working with me, but working with all my clients is I know you're your outlook on food and your relationship with food. And mm -hmm. um, that's, I think that's so huge just to take note of because mm -hmm. therapists can have all the um, knowledge in the world, but if their relationship with food, if they haven't done that work, that can come right. up and you might see that. Um, but I just want yeah. like, I think it's so cool that you have that piece. And 
I can feel so comfortable giving you a client and knowing that you and I align so much Mm -hmm. on food and body. Oh yeah, for sure. I feel like sometimes I'm always almost worried I'll scare clients away. Like in that first session when they're wanting to know more about intuitive eating or kind of what my approach is. And I feel like I'll just get off on this tangent and be so excited telling them all this stuff. And they're just like looking at me like, okay. (laughs) I mean, most of the time they come back. (laughs) Sometimes afterwards, I'm just like, okay, slow it down a little bit here. (laughs) It is. You want to shout it off the rooftops. It's 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 true. (laughs) (laughs) I always find it so interesting because sometimes I feel like the days that I have my therapy scheduled, I'll look at my calendar and be like, I don't need that today. And like, I'll think about like canceling it and then I'll get there and my therapist will be like, so what do you want to talk about today? Or like, what's going on? And I'm like, I don't really have much. Like, I don't have much to talk about. And then 55 minutes or whatever the session is goes by and she goes, really? You didn't have much to talk about? <laughs> like, like, okay, I didn't hear. <laughs> <laughs> but like you said, it's so important to have the relationship, like the client professional relationship where you feel mm-hmm. comfortable speaking about the things that make you uncomfortable Yeah, because it's so important. Absolutely. And even to piggyback off on what you just said, I think so much, especially in our culture, this busyness idea, like we're always going from one thing to another. And that's another way of kind of numbing how we're actually feeling about stuff. So I'll have people coming in all the time, just like, I don't really have anything to talk about. Like I've just been busy. Things have been going on, living my life. Um, But because that numbing's been happening, it's like, you're not even having that awareness of what's been back in, in your mind, really needing to come out and be processed. So I think just taking that time to slow down and sit with it can be huge. Like giving yourself permission to not do so much, but just to be. I can see why you two love each other. You talk like. (laughs) (laughs) You challenge me. I might talk this way with my clients, but then when it comes to personal application, I struggle. And so boundaries is one of Katie's favorite words with me, which I'm still very much so actively working on. But but try your personal growth has been so amazing though sam and it's really beautiful and inspiring to hear you talk about this because i know it's relatively new on a relative Mm -hmm. basis that you're going um and it's awesome and it's been so brilliant to see do you mind if i ask a question about social media katie is that (laughs) okay yeah not for like you personally but in general would you i'm not very good at that (laughs) would you say that you've seen a change in either your specific clients or new clients coming in with anxiety or depression um or a combination of both with relations to social media and body image in general and any recommendations that you have for the general public you know how to deal with that because Mm -hmm. personally I think Sam and I see that in our our businesses big changes because of social media I can't imagine what it must be like for you oh yeah absolutely um and I do see a fair amount of like teenage young adult type of clients and social media is basically their whole life especially right now when nobody's really interacting so I you know there's the old I don't know how old, but the saying comparison is the thief of joy. And I think that comes so into effect with social media because we're just seeing this highlight reel constantly of, okay, here's this perfect family or here's this person doing their workout or their food routine or off the coast of Italy, whatever they're doing. But that is such a small snapshot of their entire life. And I laugh a lot because I think about, you know, even clients that I'll see just how they'll talk about how chaotic life can be, but how they're trying to present themselves in this perfect put together image for everyone else to see just because of fear of judgment or the comparison issue. So I think with people, um, there definitely is research that it impacts anxiety, depression, um, views of yourself because that can take a toll when that's constantly what's coming into our minds. Um, so I always encourage people to, <laughs> Sammy's going to like this, but create those boundaries. <laughs> 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 Sometimes I hate hearing myself say that word. Um, <laughs> 
but I always talk about like mental boundaries versus physical boundaries versus the emotional, all that. So social media, it would be unfollowing those people that don't serve you going back to just, is this helping me or hurting me right now? Like very simple, um, is seeing, is looking up pictures of my ex in his new life. <laughs> helping me or hurting me is constantly watching this person's workout or weight journey or whatever they want to be focusing on. Is that helping me right now? Um, so I think if people can just kind of screen out what they're putting in front of themselves and that goes with podcasts, that goes with movies, that goes with the music we listen to because everything we take in is what, how we kind of start to view our reality. Um, so setting up that, those changes and then even limiting the amount of time each day that you're on it and just trying to say, okay, this is, this is my time for social media, but I know that I would like to be getting real interaction, real connection, real fresh air in this moment and actually be doing some of the things that I'm looking at on this screen. So why don't I just do that right now? Like, mm. What can I control? So what a good way to say it. I think yeah. right now that's been so true for people too. As I like what you just through. said, doing it, like doing what those people are doing. Like I could even watch them do it or I could go actually do the thing right. that I'm staring at. That's a really great point. Right. And I think I notice it with, um, especially like teenagers who are struggling with friendships, seeing so much on social media about other people having these friendships, relationships, connecting, but they're just focusing on the screen and how they're not having friends. They're not connecting, but why not just go out and try to create opportunity for yourself to be able to have some of these same experiences. Um, so it takes practice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, I think there's the social media like rabbit hole we could go down right oh. now. It's like, cause I think <laughs> I agree with you, Jenna, from our client's perspective, it's more like comparison, like the comparison trap, what people are eating, uh -huh. what their bodies look like, what diet they're on, et cetera, et cetera. But I don't know if you agree with me, Jenna, but as <laughs> an entrepreneur and um, someone who has a virtual business for you, like so much of your business is on social media. So setting those boundaries of like when to turn off and when to <laughs> Yeah. So that's something I've been working on as well. Uh -huh. And I think a lot of people, and even if you don't own a business, even if you're not an entrepreneur, just turning off and yeah, instead of you know, commenting back on someone's comment on your picture, like look up and look at your partner or call a friend or doing something that is mm -hmm. like true connection. Not that real connections don't happen on social media because I don't want to undermine the beauty of it sometimes, but right. Um, but it, it definitely is, is something we... There's a fine line. <laughs> <laughs> what you just said, Katie, is it helping me or hurting me? I think that it can be both. Yeah. And I've splinter asked that fence for a long time of <laughs> it helping and hurting me because it can really distract you from oh, yeah. so many realities. And I think that's been a topic of conversation that I speak with my therapist about a lot. Mm -hmm. um, it's it can take you out of reality a lot uh, in all yeah. different areas of your life, personal, professional, relationships, everything. I'm mm -hmm. pointing like you know what I'm pointing to. Um, but relationships. I, right? <laughs> He's upstairs. Um, <laughs> can I ask another question about just signs and symptoms, specifically right now? We are right in the middle of about almost one month into shelter in place here in New Jersey. I know you guys are about a week behind us in Florida, but as far as people understanding symptoms of depression, like an acute depression or not necessarily generalized depression, but situational. Right. Is that a thing and something that people can be experiencing right now and maybe not really knowing it? I know personally, mm -hmm. I mentioned on a call about not really having an appetite right now could be related to heightened anxiety, stress, depression. Oh, for um, sure. But there's other symptoms that we might be experiencing that we might not recognize. Can you speak mm -hmm. to that at all? Yeah, I think right now, um, absolutely, the acute depression's happening, increased anxiety, um, 
people have described the time that we're in as kind of like a collective trauma that we're all living through together. So with trauma comes anxiety, depression, those typical trauma responses. So there might be more hypervigilance happening, like extra aware, extra protective of yourself, your family, your your um, property, your belongings, all of that. Toilet as paper. we can see from toilet paper, <laughs> right. <laughs> It's like, what the heck? <laughs> One square, please. <laughs> yeah, that's it. <laughs> oh my gosh, I, I was thinking, I'm out of avocados, and I was like, how much of a first world problem am I having right now that I'm stressing out over being out of avocados? But, <laughs> but um, so that hypervigilance, the overprotection, um, people's sleep schedules might be off. So either not sleeping at all or sleeping way more than normal. Mm -hmm. um, just not feeling like doing much of anything. So that might be work-related, not being motivated for work, not being motivated to get outside, not being motivated to call family, call friends, do whatever type of mm -hmm. con con connection we can do right now. Um, Maybe just tearfulness, the mood being really down, kind of feeling hopeless, or just apathetic, like, I don't really care right now. Nothing's really going to affect me. I, I feel that numbness. Um, so I think all of those are definitely parts of it, and there's probably more that I'm not mentioning that I'm just blanking out on, but I definitely think, like you said, under eating or eating maybe more than what your body is feeling like it needs, but again, that's just a response and that's okay. This isn't permanent. That's always what I say. Whatever we're going through right now, it's not permanent. The emotion's not permanent. The situation's not permanent. We just have to give ourselves as much compassion and grace as we can because that cycle of guilt and shame and you're not doing good enough, you're failing is what's going to make the depression just go even further. So if you could speak to, I know you've done for, for my virtual group coaching, you've done a video on this and it was very eloquent how you discussed it, but just kind of great grazing <laughs> on, you are so well-spoken. I watched this video and she's like, so calm. And she's like closing her eyes. And I was like, oh my gosh. It's so good. <laughs> so, I cannot tell you how many times I had to do that. I kept messing it up. I'm like, oh, I'm breathing wrong. <laughs> Therapists oh are people God. too. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes, absolutely. But kind of going in now, I guess that intuitive eating principle has changed, but coping with emotions with kindness, it used to be, mm -hmm. um, what was it? Honoring our feelings without food or without like, food. Yeah. Would you like yeah. me to open the book? I oh, have yeah, it right here. Have it. <laughs> it's always at my desk. You keep going. I'll find it. <laughs> but so if you could, I, I forget the three P's, but I know there was like pause. There was a few. So if you could, could just kind of oh, go yeah. through and it's okay if you don't know them right now. I don't want to Process, Hold postpone, pause, process, postpone. postpone. It's yeah, principle it seven, cope with your emotions without using food, which is now being redone. Yeah. So it's okay. re reworded to coping okay. with your emotions with kindness. So just kind of like walking that. someone through if they aren't, or let's say they are over, um, are eating themselves to a place of physical unpleasantness just mm -hmm. because they're trying to cope. Um, mm -hmm. So I know you said it's really important, like giving yourself grace and um, this is not permanent, but just kind of maybe some tips of how they can further do that. Kind of in that, in the moment coping. Yeah. Mm hmm Well, to go back to the three Ps, since you reminded, <laughs> <laughs> you reminded me of them. Um, the pause was just kind of pausing with where you are in, in this moment. So doing some of the deep breathing, the mindfulness. It can be 10 seconds of breathing is just enough to bring us back to this moment and really be able to check in with our body, our thoughts, what's actually happening internally versus all of the, you know, I call them spaghetti thoughts because I just think of a bunch of spaghetti all over our mind flying everywhere. <laughs> they just so all scattered awesome. together. Um, it might not make sense to anybody but me. But so we have all these spaghetti thoughts. So we just have to kind of come back to the moment, breathe a minute, let that oxygen get back to our brain so we can truly process how we're feeling. Um, and then as far as the process uh, piece of it, I'm a huge fan of journaling. I think it can do so much for people 
just the act of physically writing and how that helps the, the sides of both sides of our brain kind of process in more of a full brain connection. But um, if you don't like journaling, then just draw something, do some coloring, do anything that's going to bring you out of your head and into this moment. So sewing, doing cross stitching, things like that. I'm not good at that. I can't do it. I, I'm being real. Um, I'm so not artistic, but I can color. So doing whatever it is to get you back into the space and getting away from the screen, getting away from the social media, um, processing through, okay, right now I'm sitting here. What am I needing right now? Am I actually needing food? Am I feeling it in my stomach? Am I feeling maybe the lightheadedness? Whatever hunger signal my body gives, is that what's happening? Or am I feeling more of the heart hunger, which is something I talked about, um, I think, in that um, course with you all. But the heart hunger versus stomach hunger is such an easy thing to come back to because it's focusing on more, is this an emotional need I'm having or is it more of a physical need? So the emotional need could be connection, it could be um, validation, it could just be, it might not even be emotional, it might just be that you need a hug, you need some physical touch, anything like that. And once you're able to walk yourself through and really think about what you're needing, how can I give that to myself? I might be alone in my apartment, but how can I give this to myself? Is it giving myself a little massage? Is it writing in a journal the things that are actually good about myself, like giving myself those words of affirmation? Is it calling my best friend? Is it getting on a support message board online or something like that? Um, and then the last part of that is the postpone piece, which is if you're really struggling like with the food piece, I feel like I need this. It's just such a compulsion right now. That's okay. You can have the food, but let's just postpone it so it's more enjoyable in a few minutes and eaten in a more present space. And instead, let's come back to the moment, kind of go through that processing of how you're feeling. Once you're in a more, uh, at a calmer baseline, then you can go back, enjoy that snack, own it, eat it. It's all yours, but first go through the process so that you're doing it with more awareness of what's happening versus as a fear response, an emotional response, that type of thing. That's super helpful. I, I always love how you explain that. <laughs> I mean, I always use, you know, I, I teach that intuitive eating principle as well. And I yeah. feel like it's so relevant right now. Mm -hmm. um, and some people are experiencing both like the overconsumption or um, physical unpleasantness, like mm -hmm. feeling fullness or as Jenna was saying earlier, the like not nothing really sounding good or like mm -hmm. my husband and I today is his birthday and we were trying to come up with like what to eat for dinner and we went on a two mile walk and named every dish that's ever existed in the world and we're like nah nah <laughs> and I was like you know this is because we're like just in a rut and we've cooked every meal from home and yeah. we want to be with friends and we want to be celebrate like nothing sounds good. And like, that's okay. Like just, yeah. just noticing that. Um, but knowing that we still need mm -hmm. nourishment, we still need fuel, but it doesn't have to be this like, like over the top eating experience every it might time. Not, yeah. Eating. It might not be as pleasurable. It's yeah. still a need, but it might not have that same level of pleasure and satisfaction that it usually would. Yeah. Which goes perfectly with like the depression response. Everyday things aren't as enjoyable. Right. Mm -hmm. Same with the food. It's so mm -hmm. valuable. I think it's such a great thing for everyone to hear and also know that you're not alone in it. Um, no. I personally just, I put a post-it note up, heart hunger versus stomach hunger is like such a beautiful way to explain that. I can visualize it. And I, I mean, Sam and I do something called the nutrition tipsy each episode to okay. kind of close them all out, which is our main takeaway from our guests. And I mean, that was this whole episode has been main takeaways for me, but that was a really, just a very powerful way to describe that response. Yeah. Um, and I will awesome. say, I Thank can't you. have credit for that. I learned it in a training like five, six years ago. I don't even remember what training, which is so bad, but I love it. I so that's why well, I'm giving you credit. <laughs> <laughs> so thank, thank you. you. Yeah. 
before we close before we close out i do want to ask too just because i know we mentioned at the beginning oh if you could give a like a a simplified version of what brain spotting is because i know you're certified in that and that's like a very specialized thing that i haven't heard a lot about before Never. i worked with you <laughs> yeah so if you could just explain what, newer. what that is and maybe even like explain a a client of course hit the safe, like don't say their name, but kind of like explain what they went through or, or that process. Okay. Yeah. Um, so brain spotting is another, um, less traditional form of therapy. So EMDR is one type of trauma therapy that's very popular. It's been around for a while, lots of research, evidence-based stuff around that. Brain spotting is not as seasoned as EMDR. It's a much newer type of therapy. However, it was discovered during an EMDR session um, by an EMDR therapist. So the basic premise of brain spotting is where you look affects how you feel. So the idea is that our field of vision is back into the subconscious part of our brain, and it takes that field of vision and how it connects with the rest of our body, so those bodily sensations. So for example, if say I'm thinking about a situation, a fight that I had with a best friend and it's still creating like this anxiety for me, it was a really traumatic experience. Um, as I'm telling about this experience, I'm gonna check in with my body, notice like where am I feeling the activation here? Is it in my chest beating a lot? Am I feeling Am I clenching my hands? Are my thighs kind of clenching together? Am I feeling tension in my neck? But starting with identifying where you're feeling that activation and then taking that feeling and using your eyesight and finding where in your field of vision you feel the activation the most. So for some people, they might feel that heart pounding more when they look to the left side. Some might feel it more on the lower right side. So through the process, the therapist helps the client, based on whatever situation they're wanting to process through, be a, they, we find that place in our field of vision, and that's considered the access point to that subconscious part of our brain. So once that spot is found, we just kind of let the brain do what it needs to heal itself, because it now has the access that it needed to do that. So whatever thoughts come up, come up. Whatever memories come up, come up. I've had clients a lot of times will remember things that they have not thought about in years, but somehow their subconscious connected these weird situations in a way that was not so helpful. So this is the brain reprocessing those situations so that it's taking that emotional distress away from the memory or the situation. So it's, it can be, it's a very intense process, I'll say that. Um, I'll, the work that your brain's doing during a brain spotting session can be the work of like eight talk therapy sessions within an hour or an hour and a half. So people are probably going to be pretty emotionally and mentally drained afterwards and they might experience that not so good feeling for the couple of days after it just because their brain is still working because it was doing so much during the session. Um, but it can make changes right away after just a few sessions, whereas um, regular talk therapy, it might take 20, 30, 40 sessions to process through this one experience. So amazing things can happen, and sometimes things that we didn't even know we were worried about come out because it's the subconscious stuff. That is fascinating. I but think we're gonna, look it up. <laughs> we're gonna definitely need another session because or maybe we can quickly touch on it but emotional exhaustion like what you just said i think a lot of people are also experiencing that now and mm -hmm. don't know how to categorize that can you just say again that it's a real thing and that you oh my gosh feel, yeah you can feel tired from these things like for days because your body is just actually drained even though you didn't exercise air quotes you know, it could be difficult to move and to stand and to walk in your normal routine. I hear oh that from people, yeah. but I didn't do anything. I'm like, but you're processing like our world changing right now. And that's okay. Yes. Yeah, so much is happening. There's so much fear, anxiety, uncertainty, 
um, financial distress. They're like our minds are taking on so much ick right now that it makes sense that some people can't get out of bed at all. It makes sense that you're feeling more depressed. It makes sense that you're not wanting to talk to people and you're more irritable. Um, I think emotional exhaustion is absolutely valid and real right now. And um, we're all dealing with it to a certain extent. And that's why taking care of yourself is that much important. Yeah. Mm. This is an amazing, I feel like it was like a therapy session. The best. I feel so good right now. <laughs> but I think it'll be helpful. Like every, everything that you talked about will be helpful, but that was such a great way to tie it all together yeah. with both of you, you know, recognizing that because that's so true, Jenna, like so many people right now you're seeing like, and then, and then they're going on social media. <laughs> Why am I not doing this workout, this right. diet, this 30 day cleanse? Da, 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 da. I can't even get out of bed. And then that comparison is on top of the emotional exhaustion is just catapulting it. So I think oh, great, yeah. grace and curiosity of why we are the way we are and what's coming up is yes. so, so huge. Being well, a student of yourself. I love that. Katie, you are so inspiring. So please tell everybody how they can find you. <laughs> I know a lot of people are going to want to after listening to this. Yeah. Well, I really like therapy, but I'm not very good at technology. So <laughs> I'm working on that. I am working on it. A boundary um, for you. It's okay. <laughs> I know. Like you really need to write your website, but I'm like, and I haven't had one in five years and it's going fine. So, <laughs> um, but I'll have one soon or it'll be finished soon enough. So on Instagram, um, I am the counselor. Katie is my handle. And again, it is not very exciting. It's not the biggest social media platform, but you can get in touch with me there or they can find me through email with um, info at intuitiveeatingjacksonville.com, which is my website that I don't have yet. <laughs> <laughs> that's all right. But as long as people can get in touch with you, I think that's that, that next step of just starting yeah. the conversation and, and just being curious about what things would come up for them. Um, and if we were able to just plant that seed today, then I think it was, it was a huge success. So yeah. And thank y'all for having me. It's fun to have interaction with other, <laughs> with other human beings, connection, with human beings and people that want to talk about the fun stuff. So yeah. Thank you for being here and sharing all your wisdom with us. Oh, yeah. Thank you all. Guys, thank you so much for listening and being here with us. I am virtually cheersing all of you. We absolutely love sipping on a cocktail with you and sharing as many nutrition tipsies as possible during this episode. We know there are a ton of pods out there, and we are so appreciative of your time that you spent listening to us today. Please be sure to check out the show notes for episode details and all of our guest information. We promise to keep bringing you the best and the most knowledgeable and fun guests we possibly can. Please be sure to subscribe, like, share, and post if you enjoyed our content today. And visit us on Instagram and Facebook at Drunk Dietitians to find out what is up next for us on the pod. We absolutely love you. We appreciate you and can't wait to spend more time cheersing with you soon.